I said to the president of the university, do you want a multi-purpose hall where you can have your end of term speeches and do a bit of theater in it? Or do you want a concert hall which works so well, which is so refined and so notorious that musicians will beat a path across the world to play in it? And there was a long pause and she said, I think we want the latter, Nicholas. <laughs> The brief for Impact at the outset was for a performing arts centre with a fabulous concert hall at the centre of it. In our case, the biggest challenge was to build a concert hall which would accommodate any kind of music which has been produced over the last 700 years in the Western culture. Nick Grimshaw in particular was very enamored by this idea that the concert hall would be presented as a kind of analog, smooth volume in the center of the building and, and was somewhat redolent of a musical instrument. The acoustics of the concert hall were expressed in the building, almost like a, you know, a Stradivarius violin. It had this sense of timelessness, a sense of um, quality and handcraft and would be projecting this idea that whilst musical styles change over the years, the physics of sound doesn't change. And this was kind of like a driving credo, in a sense, uh, that ran through the rest of the design process. It's a very unique building in that it's kind of upside down. Most concert halls are performing arts centers. You enter at the bottom and you move up through the space. In this case, you enter at the top and you have to cross a bridge then you go through these very bold portals into the concert hall, in a way preparing you for the music. The concert hall interior, the geometry of it was really shaped by the collaboration uh, between Grimshaw and our acoustician on the project. The acoustician who was explaining why you don't really want any flat areas because you can get a straight reflection, like a mirror. So that was a learning experience. Both the side walls and the, the, the front and the back walls are gently curved. With convex walls, the sound does not reflect like a billiard ball like this, but it's like split up into tens or hundreds of billiards balls, which move into different directions, into all three dimensions, bouncing off from that wall. This idea of uh, convex surfaces and diffusive quality cascades down through the smaller details in the room. And the acquisition forbade us from having repeating elements in the room. The reason for doing this is if you had something that was very regular, you can actually do funny things to the acoustics. So the surfaces of the wall are carefully designed to break up sound. So the acoustician collaborated with the architect again by specifying it should be non-repetitive, it should have this distance between the different ripples, and then the architects developed the aesthetic appearance of this and how it should be milled like the wangi wood and the maple wood, how it would be interspersed and how wide these could be from an aesthetic perspective and from an acoustical perspective. And that was a collaboration to design all these details together. You could say the concert hall is a lights-on environment. It's a room that's designed to see and be seen in. So the architecture is very present in that room. But then at the other end of the line of architectural formality, you have the black box, which is otherwise known as Studio One. That's a lights-off environment, so that's meant to completely recede. There's meant to be no architectural presence in the room. It's big, it's the largest studio. It's all black. The whole studio is floating on springs, so no sound can go in and out. Johannes was somewhat torn because he wanted this to be quite a sort of scientific and neutral sounding room, but with a certain presence. 
So I said to the architect and the acoustician, have you ever listened to music in a clearing of a forest? I said, no. I said, well, I've made sounds in clearing of forests and they sound actually very nice. Well, after he said that, I spend a lot of times in the woods in upstate New York. So let's look at a clearing of a forest. You are in a clear space and you have trees around you. And the trees all have different diameters. They have different bark, so they absorb and reflect differently. That's what I'm looking for. I would find myself shouting in the woods or, or clapping uh, and then hearing the reflection from, uh, you know, from the surrounding trees. What he meant was that there was a degree of acoustic reflection coming from the tree trunks. You could hear a bit of an echo, but at the same time there's incredible clarity, so that you, you know, have this almost primal heightened senses in, in the forest. We learned a great deal about how to use sound as an element of architecture, not just in rooms that are made for music, but also how one can manipulate the acoustic experience of a building the same way we manipulate materials that we use, or structure for that matter. Usually in projects like this, you have an architect and an acoustician, and there's a battle going on between the two. And usually one wins out and the other one kind of has to accommodate the winner in this discussion. What is extremely good with MPEC is that you see a unique concert hall where the architecture is totally fused with the acoustics because there was no winner or loser in that battle. But there was a constant exchange and then all of them merging into this final building.